The New Jersey Communications Advertising and Marketing Association presents new tools for creative professionals. This program was recorded January 10th, 2012 in Princeton, New Jersey. Featured presentations from Ed McLaughlin, Chief Marketing Technologist and Co-Founder of SVM eMarketing Solutions. And from Brian Crooks, Executive Creative Director of Influence Interactive. Your moderator is Matt Kulsar, Interactive Designer with Creative Marketing Alliance. I'd like to introduce Ed McLaughlin, who is the Chief Marketing Technologist and Co-Founder of SVM eMarketing Solutions. Uh, he will be giving a presentation entitled, and I love the title of this one, The Rise of the Distributed Agency. It has such a nice, ominous sound to it. Uh, Ed has a distinguished career working with clients uh, such as Rutgers University, Discover Card, uh, and Morgan Stanley. So, Ed? Thank you very much. Thanks for... Uh for uh, having me here this evening, and uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to, to share this topic with you. The rise of the distributed agency, Beth Brody and I were back and forth uh, uh, a number of times about uh, what to call this, and uh, I call it the distributed agency. I don't know if it's got uh, any sizzle, but, but it, is, it is what it is, so um, I'm going to try to help you understand, uh, understand the idea behind it and how it's, uh, it's quite relevant to... Uh, to um, all of us, regardless of whether, frankly, we're an agency or if we're a freelancer, uh, even if we're from uh, a company, from a marketing organization within a, the corporate environment. I think the ideas that I'd like to share with you tonight, I think, are relevant for all of us from, from uh, the same perspective in some cases, but from uh, different perspectives than others. So, so the rise of the distributed agency, how the cloud, open source, and collaborative technologies create unbounded opportunities for agencies and creatives. Let me start with a quote. There is great disorder under heaven, and the situation is excellent. And that was said by uh, Chairman Mao, who is the former leader of a, uh, a large Asian uh, lending institution, also known as China. So it's funny because I, I, I love the quote, there's great disorder under heaven, and the situation is excellent. We're going to talk about the disorder, much of which is, is probably apparent to, to us, but. Uh, uh, the excellent situation is, uh, is what uh, is most interesting. Um, I do think it's a measure of the great disorder of things that, you know, the uh, largest communist country in the world is, uh, is, is uh, uh, the bankroller for the largest uh, uh, capitalist country in the world right now. So what that, what that means entirely, I'm not sure. But uh, great disorder. So the great disorder that's, that's out there in the world right now has, uh, has made uh, agency life and certainly the lives of creatives difficult. Anybody uh, in business or uh, uh, out of business, uh, anybody with a job, without a job, uh, the great disorder in the world has made things difficult. So let's, let's review very briefly. So the economy, marketing budgets, uh, agency resources, uh, based on my in-depth critical analysis, have gone from uh, three measures from bad uh, to worse to uh, what I would call incredibly sucky. Right? So uh, uh, everybody knows what the picture is out there, but um, it has certainly had its impact on, on uh, marketing, uh, on agencies, and on marketing budgets. So it is a difficult climate out there. And uh, at the same time that uh, we're experiencing this very difficult economic uh, climate, and uh, uh, all these uh, uh, cuts in budgets and, uh, and, and uh, rolling back of resources, at the same time that that's happening, there's this radical shift in how businesses and how consumers make purchases, how they buy things, right? what they're using the internet for. Uh, and a radical shift in where influence occurs in the process and who the influences are. Now, I, 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 I'm, I'm presupposing here that you guys are familiar with the zero moment of truth concept, the ZMOC concept. All right, if you are, if you're not, throw, throw a hand up in the air. Out of curiosity. Hmm. All right, well, I'm not going to tell you what it's about in great detail, <laughs> but this is what I'm going to suggest. ZMOT, the Zero Moment of Truth, you can go to zeromomentoftruth.com, and, uh, and there's an e-book uh, that is worth uh, spending some time with. This is one of AdAge's top ten uh, uh, books uh, to read last year, the, the Zero Moment of Truth. It's from Google, and it's from uh, Procter and & Gamble, and, and, uh, and a few other companies. Um, uh, but uh, 
The idea behind it is that, uh, in a nutshell, I'm going to try to make this uh, as, as nutshell as possible. You know, the, uh, the traditionally, uh, what we've been targeting as marketers is that stimulus point, right? And what uh, that stimulus point was, the goal was, was to, to ensure ourselves that during that first moment of truth, right, that, uh, that ours would be the brand, or our clients would be the brand that was recognized. So our job as marketers was to get our brand out there, get our message out there, get it ingrained in the consumer such that when they walked into the store and they looked at the shelf and there were 10 options, the option that they purchased was ours because it was the brand they knew and trusted, right? So that was a model that, that worked excellent for a long time. And it contained those three, those three areas, the stimulus, the first moment of truth, and the second moment of truth. The second moment of truth being the, I bought it, now I'm either enjoying it or I'm not. What the zero moment of truth talks about is that the, uh, the stimulus, <laughs> between the stimulus and that first moment of truth, there is a big period of time. When somebody says, I'll give you an example from my own life. I decided I was going to buy a tent, a new tent. I had a very cold camping trip last spring. I decided it would be my last cold, wet camping trip, and that, and that a new tent would be uh, at the heart of it. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a minor expert now on, uh, uh, you know, four-person tent, uh, uh, on the tent. And I'm a minor expert because I started shopping for the damn tent in April of last year. I started going online. I went to this site. I went to that site. I read the reviews. I, 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 for all I know, I probably signed up for a newsletter uh, somewhere. I was followed by the Camp Moore uh, companies, uh, uh, advertising banners throughout the internet because they're obviously using remarketing. And uh, when it came time for me to purchase it, I was in Cabela's, and uh, that, that first moment of truth, I wasn't seeing all the tents I could buy for the first moment. I was looking for the tent I was going to buy. So by the time I, I was ready to make the decision, the decision had been made long ago. It was a question of when am I going to get to the store to do it. So that's the zero moment of truth, is all these interactions that are occurring, and all the, all the uh, 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 information that people can obtain through reviews, and through social media, and through word of mouth, and through you know, uh, uh, their friend Bill saying, I love this tent, and their friend Mary saying that tent is crap. That's the zero moment of truth, and that moment of truth is not about branding. That moment of truth is not about messaging. That moment of truth is about conversations that are occurring between consumers and consumers and consumers and uh, marketers and consumers and customer service uh, representatives. It is about initiating uh, the customer experience. So that's the zero moment of truth. I hope I've done it justice in my description of it. But inside of that uh, is, uh, uh, that idea is uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about, a lot of the explosion of technology that I'll be talking about briefly and how to come to terms with it because it is critical now uh, that, uh, that all of it be part of what we learn to master as marketers so, and as creative people. Um, so Zmot, zeromomentoftruth.com, I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a highly recommended uh, book by, by me for what, what that's worth. And Ad Age, me and Ad Age, we both, we both uh, recommend it highly. <laughs> so, uh, so great disorder, so that was part one. Part one is the economy. Uh, part two is this explosion, uh, uh, or, or pardon me, this radical shift in how we buy things now, and the, you know, the introduction of this idea of the zero moment of truth. Part three is resulting from uh, the way that people are doing business, the way that people are buying things, and contributing to the way that people are doing these things. It's an explosion of new technologies and new media. Uh, the media we are all familiar with, the, 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 uh, the social networks, the YouTubes, uh, Google, uh, uh, you know, 10,000 websites and forums and discussions and blah, 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 blah. So there's an explosion of outlets and places where the consumers are, where, where people are going, and places where they are talking about the stuff that, uh, that we're trying to, to, to market, to sell. So now at the same time that there's that explosion of media, this, this chart right here is from a, a gentleman named Scott Breaker who has a company that's called Zion Interactive, and his is right here. And this is a picture of the technology that uh, all comes to bear in some way
way, shape, or form within the marketing communications world today, and this isn't all of it, but by his estimate, this might be a third of it. You know, and this is the com you know, commercial and investment in uh, open source stuff. And it represents uh, uh, the customer experience, marketing management, external promotions, the stuff that we use to make digital uh, marketing. You know, so the, the tools that we're using to make websites, the tools that we're using to make our banner ads. Uh, that's all in there. But beyond that, it's the tools that we're using to manage the engagement, to do our analytics, our tracking, and stuff like this. The stuff didn't exist five years ago. Well, some of it existed, but a huge chunk of it certainly didn't exist uh, uh, eight years ago. So it's an explosion. And, uh, and it, is, <laughs> it is the stuff of which our marketing is made. And uh, it is also the stuff that we are using to measure the effect of our marketing. And that is, of course, itself a feedback loop. We know it works. We feed it back into the process. And we refine everything. So, um, and uh, the second is just a, a graph showing the, the points of interconnection between uh, 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 the, the different properties that are out there, different medias, how information from one can feed into another, can feed into another, can feed into another, can feed back into the first. So it's an explosion. And it's uh, part three of the great disorder. So all of this, uh, this explosion, uh, it has created uh, a hugely vast digital media landscape right, that is dynamically targeted right, and minutely targeted, you know, very specific uh, targeting that's getting more and more specific every day. It's instantly responsive. So if I'm a consumer, I can find out information instantly about something I'm, I'm looking to purchase. I can get an opinion from 10,000 people instantly on, on anything I want. My camp, my, my tent that I finally bought had uh, five years of reviews going back on it. And it sucked five years ago. But the quality of it really improved over time. They really fixed it. So, um, so it's instantly responsive in, uh, in, in, a, in a very broad way. And it's minutely measurable. So the measurable uh, potential of online media, of digital media, is, uh, is what drives so much of the technology, that we can get it out there and we can immediately uh, uh, get a response back and measure the impact of it and make decisions about that. So um, that's the great disorder part four, is that it's all feeding into this, this, this digital media landscape. So that introduces what I call the great disorder paradox, right? So agencies and creatives that want to prevail in this new landscape, they have to adapt, right? But adaptation requires embracing this host of new skills and technologies, trying to master that insane marketing technology uh, 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 landscape that I just showed you. The paradox, though, is that agencies and creatives are already stretched thin by the, the great disorder that we talked about, part one of the great disorder, that the economy stinks. And if you've got tons of cash, or somebody's paying you tons of cash, then uh, you have all the room and uh, all the opportunity in, in the world to embrace these technologies. But if you are a small agency, a, uh, a, a solo practitioner, a freelancer, uh, a, uh, a corporation, a, you know, a corporate marketing group that's got a tight budget, um, uh, it's difficult to say, to understand how am I gonna be able to get my arms around these things? How am I gonna, how am I gonna get the people that are qualified to use these tools, especially if I'm in, in, in a situation where I only need to use that tool once, you know? I've got one client that's asking for that. So that's the paradox, that the, those things that we saw before, those are the, those are the things that we kind of need to understand, but it's very difficult for us to uh, acquire the resources that are necessary to understand them. So uh, the conclusion is that um, if you have a sense that I do, that a lot of companies might feel like they're underwater, a lot of uh, uh, you know, creative people might feel like they're uh, sort of uh, uh, being engulfed by a tidal wave of, of uh, technology, um, the conclusion is that life underwater is great if you have gills, right? So adaptation is great if you can figure out how to do it. So that's, that's the great disorder part of things. So um, now the, uh, the, uh, uh, as the chairman told us, uh, there is great disorder under heaven and uh, the situation is excellent. So we have to ask ourselves, what is so excellent about 
this particular situation, Chairman. And um, um, I'd like to introduce a, another revolutionary character for you, uh, just to keep it with the communist revolutionary theme for no good reason. I thought it was funny. Sorry. So the decline of everything else has coincided with, and it has spurred on, a relatively quiet computing revolution as well. And uh, I say relative because uh, I think the last major revolution that we had was, I, I think, was the dot-com era itself, was explosive. And everybody and uh, their grandmother was asking me, you know, what is this stuff? How are people making money off of it, dot-coms? So there has been a revolution, frankly, with these four things uh, that uh, I think are on par with the initial dot-com revolution. Um, but not, not as much press on it. And uh, they include open source software. Generally, uh, uh, is there an understanding of, of what open source software is? So good. All right, so open source software, um, I, I look at open source software, you know, during the, uh, this period of great disorder for the last uh, uh, 10 years, you know, the uh, 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 programmers have kind of headed off into the hills, like Che and Fidel, and uh, they've been out there working, and they occasionally have come down to the, into the cities and, uh, and uh, disrupted uh, what we've been doing with open source technology. The first uh, uh, and biggest was probably uh, a system called Linux, which is uh, an operating system which powers 75% of the websites that you visit every day. Um, so that was the first big open source software movement. Uh, since then, uh, they've been coming down to the hills and actually they are living among us and uh, open source software is in 95% of, uh, of, uh, of enterprises, large and small, are using it in some way, shape, or form, open source, uh, source software. So open source software itself um, has also created this, uh, this uh, phenomenon of cloud computing. And cloud computing is a lot of different things for a lot of different people. But um, I will define cloud computing as uh, on-demand uh, utility-based computing, OK? And it could be a platform, a computing platform, uh, such as uh, a, uh, uh, like uh, Google has a, their apps, Google, uh, Google Apps. Um, or, or, I won't say Google Apps. Google has their app engine, is what it is. And if you happen to be a developer who uses a language called um, Python, you can go and use Google's resources, put your code up there, create an application, and Google will run it for you, right? So that's a platform as a service. Infrastructure as a service. If you need a, a bunch of computers uh, and a, a virtual network, uh, you, can get, you can get them. You can, you, can get a, you can get 100 computers and a virtual network and you know, uh, you know, 1,000 terabytes, a petabyte of storage from Amazon you can dial it up and you can use it for a week and then shut it down. So that's infrastructure as a service. And then there's software as a service, which is kind of the face of it that are, most of us are familiar with. So the Salesforce.coms and uh, Basecamps, those applications that we use that are just out there somewhere, right? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the drop boxes, you know, we put stuff out there, it's there, it's safe, and uh, we share it, and it's great. So software as a service, that's all part of cloud computing. And that's what the X as a service stands for. So open source software, cloud computing, they have made these things possible, the as a service. Uh, uh, and then we have the social collaborative technologies. So now certainly from a social perspective, we know about Facebook, we know about LinkedIn. But there is a, another uh, level that is a, a uh, more of a sort of an applied uh, uh, social media that I would call, that I call social collaborative technologies. And they are software as a service, but they are designed kind of for, for group integration, um, not just to facilitate uh, sharing uh, uh, photos and updates, but actually to uh, facilitate getting stuff done, right? So uh, social collaborative technologies are, are, uh, are what has come out of this quiet computing revolution. So and these things have all built on each other. And I would put $10 down right now uh, uh, and bet that there isn't a person in this room who uh, isn't using all four of these things, whether you're, whether you're cognizant of it or not, where your, your business life right now is dependent on some aspects of this. I, 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 would, uh, I, would, uh, I would lay odds that there isn't a person in this room who doesn't rely on the results of this revolution. 
So that's part one of our, of our excellent situation, is that this stuff is out there. So, and it's, and it's important because it has made available to you and me high quality, low cost, business critical services in the cloud, right? And I, I put them into three groups, those, uh, those services. Social networking services, uh, collaborative project services, and infrastructure services. So the last stage, we were just talking about the stuff of it, you know, open source software, operating systems, uh, uh, computer storage, computing power, all right? These are the things that, that emerge out of it and are the things that we can actually buy to do what we do better. So, um, and, uh, and they all live in the cloud, not in our office, not in our network storage area, uh, but out there online, accessible to us from wherever we happen to be, where we have uh, a network connection. So. Let me describe it in a, a little bit more detail. So excellent situation part three. So social networks, networking services. I, I define this to mean uh, the uh, means to connect to a worldwide pool of talent for knowledge sharing and on-demand resource pooling, right? such as freelancers, strategic partners, crowdsourcing. Right? But these are not social networks designed to simply uh, 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 you know, keep our, our friends and business partners up to date. These are social, social networking services that are designed to help us build networks that we're going to leverage to deliver what we do. Collaborative project services are digital environments and tools for creating and delivering projects with a distributed team. So the social networking service, they let us build a team. The collaborative project services, they let us enact what we're going to do with our team. Right? That, that's the environment that they create. And then there's infrastructure services. All right? And these are the tools that are um, uh, hosted services that we need, need to use to run our business. Uh, accounting services, CRM services, timekeeping, content management, right? the things that we need to have available to us to make sure that, that the, the boat continues to row, you know, that we continue to move forward as a business. Uh, and then also the storage services, uh, or, or services like storage, email, even phone systems. Right? So. Um, so the excellent situation for us is that, uh, that these things all exist. And uh, at, at the same time that, that, that life has become very difficult, uh, uh, business life has become very difficult, um, these things have been created. So the question is, is how, do we, how do we take advantage of these things? You know, how do we leverage the excellent situation that exists out there in order to, to, to overcome the impact of the great disorder? on our lives and, uh, and to profit from it, if possible. Not from the disorder so much as the, as the, as the excellent situation. So um, the, uh, the distributed agency is a model that is designed to take advantage of all those things. Right? So um, I'm going to describe this section as unbounded, how agencies and creators can change their game plans and how we can leverage uh, everything that, that I've just talked about in order to rethink the way that we're doing business. So here's the big idea. It's supposed to be one at a time. There's, there's my, there's my, uh, my, my impact is gone. Anyway, big idea. Be digital. That's big idea number one. Move to digital environments and technologies. Create a seamless yet borderless organization. Embrace digital marketing. If, um, if you're in marketing, this, this is my opinion. If you're in marketing today um, and you're not digital, you're not measurable, you're not driving somebody to a web property where it can get measured and you can convert them from a person reading a piece of paper or seeing a, uh, a link somewhere uh, into a prospect or a customer. Um, if you're not doing those things, you are, uh, you're, uh, you're, you're dying on the vine. And, uh, and, uh, uh, because marketing is, is digital marketing now. So the first uh, idea of the distributed agency is that uh, you need to be digital. You need to embrace the technology and leverage the technology to, in part, deliver the technology to your clients. So that's idea one. Idea two is be unbounded. So unleash yourself from old technology, old infrastructure, old organization structures, so that you can move in step with the pace of change, right? 
And the, the last idea is the idea of going global. Cultivating partnerships with masterful talents wherever they may roam uh, so that you can deliver the product of their skill to your clients. So if I may, just talk about these three ideas. You know, the idea of moving in step with the pace of change. The fact is, is that the explosion of technology, uh, the, the idea that one would somehow, that a small agency or one creative uh, 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 person or even a marketing organization for, for even a medium, even a large size company, the idea that you could embrace all of those technologies and figure out what to use when and have the resources on hand, in-house, ready to, to leverage those at the right opportunity are, are slim to none. So in order to move in step with the pace of change, we need to have resources at our disposal uh, that, we can, that we can call upon as necessary to be able to, uh, to uh, help us deliver what we need to deliver, help us meet the demands that, are, that our clients are putting out there. So, so those are the big ideas. And uh, the return for those of us uh, that, uh, that, that adopt these ideas, in my mind, um, is that they create huge opportunities for us. Right? So for those of us who, you know, who are able to embrace the ideas behind the distributed agency, I think there's huge opportunities. The opportunities include staying competitive and increasing revenue by providing new services that are in demand. Services that we can't currently provide, the distributed agency model puts us in a position where we can provide them without losing our, uh, our shirt. Reducing costs and increasing margins by leveraging services, uh, by leveraging services on demand and utility computing, the things that the infrastructure provides us, and becoming agile and scalable, right? Growing with demand and uh, not with the expectation of demand. So the idea that we can meet demand, uh, meet those demands. I have five minutes, is that right? Okay, it's gonna work out just perfectly. Because I have a five, uh, a five minute period of silence after, after this slide. Um, so become agile and scalable, growing with demand, not with the expectation of demand. You know, using the resources uh, that, that are out there when you need them, um, not having, the, not having the, the, the costs associated with trying to maintain all these resources uh, in-house. So um, that's the return. Some examples of, of, uh, of um, agencies or uh, creative people that, are, that have a, uh, a core competency right now in one area and uh, what they might do to think about where they could, uh, they could leverage this distributed idea to grow from where they are out to new areas. So copywriting, for example. If you're a wordsmith, why wouldn't you be in search engine optimization and pay-per-click advertising? Um, it is ultimately about words. So if you're a copywriter, you should be out in that environment. Not ready to be out in that environment, don't know enough about it, not Google AdWords certified, don't know the first thing about search engine optimization. There are a thousand companies out there that are ready to work with you. If you understand your client and you understand their needs and you understand their audience, more importantly, in that particular case, and the, audi the language that their audience uses, then you don't need to know a thing about SEO in order to uh, in order to be able to work with SEO uh, practitioners and, and, and experts to deliver to your client. Um, public relations, if you're not a social media expert yet, then uh, you should be. If you're uh, in a position where you need to ramp up into that, you haven't gotten your arms around it, but your clients are demanding it, then find a group that, that, is, uh, that has expertise in social media, right? And, uh, and find a way and, 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 and incorporate their offerings into your offerings. Uh, for a, a design perspective, marketing now, because marketing is digital and because marketing is about that zero moment of truth and it's about interactions and it's about experience, um, marketing itself is about human interactions. So design, therefore, must be about the design of human interactions. So are you designing graphics or are you designing a user experience? Uh, are you designing ads or are you designing interfaces? Are you ready for mobile? The, uh, the challenges from that design perspective are, 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 are manifold. Uh, every time you turn around, there's something new happening, and your designers need to know not just how to make it look nice, it really has to work nice. You have to have a team of people that are creating basically software all the time. Um, so finding people that will complement your skill set, that will enhance your core competencies, um, that's what uh, the distributed agency is all about. 
So, and uh, you're delivering the message, this is another example, but are you delivering measurable results? Partner with an analytics pro. Uh, if you're delivering a reach, but you're not delivering revenue, find people that are CRM experts. So you can demonstrate to your clients that what you're delivering is not, uh, not reach, it's not brand uh, alone, but it's also customer, prospect, uh, uh, revenue. It's, it's bottom line uh, value. So very quickly, if I have just a couple more minutes, I'm going to run through um, some of the companies that are doing this well, and, uh, uh, or at least companies that are, very that, that are worth taking a look at, um, and also some technologies. And this is a short list, and uh, I can make this available to you. But um, let me run through it. So there's, there's, uh, there's uh, three companies that, that, that I've looked at that I think are, are doing exactly this with slight variations on, on the model. Um, the best of them is this company, uh, PR2020. And actually, PR2020 has another book I'd recommend that is called, uh, oh, the name of it I don't recall, actually. PR2020.com, it's worth going to their website. They also have a, a blog. They are practitioners of this. Explicitly, they are practitioners of what they call the hybrid uh, marketing model, where they are throughout it all together search engine optimization, public relations, brand, customer experience, customer service, uh, uh, customer relationship management. They brought it all together and they recognize that this is the new model of marketing. They are an agency that is incredibly effective at delivering that model to their customers using a lot of the ideas that, that I've talked about with the distributed agency as it. Um, Victors and Spoils is an interesting group. They, they leverage this thing that they call crowdsourcing. Uh, uh, somewhat, um, somewhat, uh, um, uh, what would I say? Uh, some people don't like it, yeah. <laughs> so, some people don't like it uh, uh, because they put ideas out there and uh, they ask for, for ideas and they'll get a thousand ideas and one of them will win and that will be the idea that they go forward with. They pay a little bit for the idea, and, uh, but they, uh, they, uh, they charge a lot for the implementation of it. So, there are some, uh, there's some controversy to it. Uh, Co-collective, interesting group. Um, they are, uh, as it says, you know, um, flexible collaboration with a network of expert partners. So there's a core of about four or five people. And that's part of the idea behind all these agencies. Uh, and uh, uh, one final one, Civic Actions, which is a not-for-profit um, uh, that has uh, a team of people in five countries. And they define themselves as the, as the uh, agile agency. Um, core set of people that are strategists, that are project managers, that are account experts, that are all technology experts in their own right. Uh, they're not programmers, they're not developers, they're people who understand where the technologies come together. Um, that, that, uh, that is what makes up the core of these organizations. And uh, that core is then able to go out and, uh, and leverage uh, all the infrastructure and tools we've talked about to find their teams, bring them together, and, and deliver. So. Last couple of slides. These are a handful of the uh, social networking uh, services, um, of the uh, actual services that uh, talked about. LinkedIn is a very obvious one. Um, but Odesk and Guru.com are great places to find very capable uh, freelancers, very capable agencies in, uh, in the United States and, uh, and abroad. Dribble uh, uh, and Behance. Um, and I would add, uh, well, Dribble and Behance are, are uh, are social networks for designers, and uh, uh, they're places where designers swap ideas, swap concepts, uh, and uh, talk about their, uh, their, their, their stuff together. So, um, uh, the infrastructure services, uh, some of these are familiar to you, but CRM services, accounting, billing, phone, voice, and, um, uh, and then uh, project collaborative services. So, Basecamp, very popular one, Dropbox, very popular, Box.com, Huddle, Right to you. So these are project collaborative services, all hosted, all in the cloud. And um, um, that's my final set of, uh, of ideas there. So uh, thanks very much. Appreciate your time. And I hope I've been instructive. Thank you, Ed. Um, it's a shame we don't have more time in between because, once again, his topic just launches so many other points about wanting to explain to you how 
Amazon has the ability to give those uh, hosting services away for free. The fact that um, they need to maintain a scalable infrastructure for two months out of the year. So for the other 10 months of the year, they basically don't do anything with it. So they can rent it out for pennies per second, which is literally how you can sign up for that service, which is rare compared to some of the other ones that charge you a monthly fee. Amazon will charge you per second for how long your site is up, and we're talking about pennies per second. But I don't want to step on anybody else's toes. <sighs> what else can I say about the next guy? Brian Crooks, 20 years of professional experience in the design field, working for clients such as Neiman Marcus, General Motors, Nestle, and Dove. He is currently the executive creative director at Influence Interactive. And uh, I got a little chuckle when I opened up his presentation. Doesn't have a title, but the concept is called Tool, which I have been called several times over the last couple of years. So without further ado, Mr. Crooks. Thank you much. When I was first asked to, to talk about this, um, the, the first thing that I thought about was, um, while tools are important, if I was going to do a documentary or if I was going to write a paper about Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Waters House, for example, I probably wouldn't include a lot of photographs of the hammers and nails that went into building it. Um, tools are important, but there are things that are more important. So right now, I'd like to show you the most important tools that creatives have today, bar none. There's one. There's another. And there's the third. We have opposable thumbs. That's the biggest one of all. And I think that um, there's a lot of sort of cockamamie notions about how creative happens, that uh, the geniuses go into darkened room and created their beige boxes and they have epiphanies and there's like symbols of light bulbs that go over their heads and all that sort of nonsense. Um, that can happen, um, but it's more often than not the, the kind of a roll of the die if you think that you, know, you can sort of squeeze hard enough and something is going to just ultimately percolate. Um, there's an art and a science to putting together things within any realm, but certainly, especially within the digital. Again, it's, it's even at, an elegantly crafted ad is a beautiful thing, but we're, we're making pieces of, of functionality. Um, it was alluded to before in the other one. What is the user experience? Um, how well has it been thought out? And too often, we rely on our clients to tell us what they think they need. You know, and again, that often happens to be the flavor of the month. I need a widget, um, I need a Facebook page, I need this, it's like, do you really? Let's find out. So what I'm gonna talk about, the big tool right now is how we can inform all of these wonderful intelligent people that we work with, including ourselves. It's about feeding their heads, right? Because that's the one thing before we start wagging our opposable digits and this and that, or start moving around pixels or whatever other medium that we work in, we have to have some sort of notion that drives the creative that we're about to build. So I've taken the liberty of inventing a company. It's called Metro Suppliers. They're very hip. Um, they work out of the Navy Yard. Uh, they have stores in major metro areas, and they're purveyors of all manner of hip and groovy things. Um, tchotchkes, clothing, sort of uh, counterculture-esque sort of things. But they also sell, and you'll notice, women's men's apartments. Uh, they also sell furnishings. Um, and I pretended in this instance that they've come to me, because they love me, and they've asked me what I can help them do to sell more furniture. Why isn't their furniture selling? You know, because people are buying a lot of chrome Rubik's cubes and such, but they're just not buying any furniture. Well, the first thing I would do and this is, this is, again, it's a kind of analysis, it's a kind of data gathering. I do a heuristic analysis, and one of the first things I say is like, well, you might want to foreground it on your homepage a little bit. Um, you also um, might want to be tracking your users and understanding where they're coming from so that more relevant content can be brought up. But let's go a little bit further than that because heuristics are good, and we can take a look at things when we're applying our, our finely honed common sense. But there are other tools. This is a, a, a tool that we use called SiteMapper. And this is only one of the kind of visual displays that it's capable of generating. It'll actually index the entire site. It will show every page. You can click through to it. You can view it in a variety of ways. This is a, um, uh, a potential client of ours. It has nothing to do with my made-up company, but this is the only one I could find. This is a, like an egregious example of sprawl. This one company has so much 
random data, sort of lying all over its site and content and broken links and this and that sort of thing, it's, it's, it's well beyond their control and infinitely beyond the control of any of their users. So that's one thing that we can do. Let's take a look at the core of the site. So they're not buying furniture. Um, are they falling off at certain points in the purchase chain? Um, are there broken links? It, you know, form friction analysis. There's any number of different things we can do to begin to say, they like us as a brand, but they're not buying this one thing, and what's that about? So we can take a look there. And again, we can do some other things. And again, this can be done very often with free software. I'm going to show you one of my favorites. But again, there's one, this is called the you know, Quick Tales. You can actually go on there. It'll build sort of the heat map of where people go. This is an analysis that we did where we said, wow, your navigation is getting a lot of looks. And you have this enormous rotating banner that lives above the fold that takes up 30 some odd percent of your entire homepage. And you're getting like 1.2% Maybe it doesn't work. Maybe that's not what they want to see. Um, and that sort of thing. So there's other things. Again, here, if they have a Google Analytics package, it's incumbent on you to get all the creatives together and say, hey, look, um, there's some funky things going on here. There are drop-offs here and um, all of that sort of stuff. Again, another uh, software can go down, and it'll actually indicate compatibility errors, broken links, um, compliance uh, issues, 120 pages of search engine issues, 181 pages that have WPP uh, standard issues, and all that sort of stuff. Some of it's important for certain clients, some of that isn't, but it's a good first start at getting some kind of peek into their, their digital savvy. But about these customers, there's a thing called Quantcast, and I, uh, the, the, the company, um, which I refuse to name for fear of um, liability issues that I, I sort of modeled metropolitan uh, suppliers, metro suppliers on, I actually went and ran a little Quantcast sort of test on their site. So this is sort of interesting. You're talking about site traffic and a number of visits and this and that. I'm getting a sort of overall idea, but it's not the quantity that concerns me. It's who's coming there. Well, you can also do that when it comes to demographics. So what's really interesting here is, you know, if I were to just be a creative and wander into a room and start brainstorming with other creatives and be like, Wow, we have to get those 16-year-old girls to buy more furniture at this metro place, right? Because that's what it's all about, isn't it? That would be arrogant. Um, it turns out, well, yes, they are seeing that. But wait a minute. They're 18 and under, but a big group. They're really over-indexing for 18 to 34. What's really interesting also is you come down here, 33% of making over are really over-indexing this based on the standards of the, the internet. They're 100,000 pegs, which leads me to and there's other ways that I could check this, that's probably not the under 18s who are making over $100,000 a year. They also over-index for Asian, Hispanic, and African American. They under-index for Caucasian, which is not something that I would have thought of. So at some point, you have to begin to say, like, what does all this mean? Um, do I need to go and find a forester report that talks to me about the, the, the buying proclivities of the Latin American community? I mean. Sometimes the information that you get in these things makes apparent to you the information that you need to go get. And that's part of the, the great journey sort of thing. Um, let me go also, my fake company, Metro Suppliers, these are also things that they like based on sites that they visited you know, prior to coming to the site and stuff. And what's interesting, home furnishing index is quite high. So why aren't they buying it? So now we're prepared to scour the web for articles. Again, like I said here, oh, let's go out and do a little buzz metrics. This is a company that we use called Radiant 6, where you can get um, sentiment um, in the buzzos sphere, for lack of a better term. So you can find out who's talking about um, metro suppliers, um, what are the general sentiments. You can also search for anyone mentioning their apartment, their furnishings, and things like that, and begin to understand like what drives these people with their sort of brand interaction. The other thing, too, if, if, if your, your company is wealthy enough to have a Forrester subscription or a Nielsen or something like that, avail yourself of this data. This is just one piece that I found. So imagine in our scenario, I'm looking at principally women, and I'm saying between 25 and 35, because I doubt, again, the 18s are making 1,000, and under 18-year-olds are probably not furnishing their own apartments. And then you, see, you begin to sort of model who it is you're talking to, because that part of the human element is, is equally 
enforce, but any time that I say to people that we, we employ data-informed design, they, they think that I'm like a motherless robot, which is anything but. It's just like getting the gray cells sort of percolating so you can do something elegant, something small. So in this instance, our, our age group, 25 to 34, big increase in bad usage, so hmm, maybe we want to certainly address them on the website, but is it more of a phone app, or um, maybe they need to take their furnishings and move it into one of their other holdings, or something like that, but I mean, we're, we're beginning to get a picture. So now, yes, we can go out and talk to their users. As opposed to asking them, do you like this, and, or random questions that we think are appropriate, we've now sort of boiled the ocean a bit, and we understand what it is we, we ought to be asking them. And then we can do all of the great things, like have card sorting exercises with them, we can sort of like, quote unquote, job shadow, Yes, you can do focus groups. Um, the only problem there is the more you get into these you know, high touch things, the more the investment increases. Um, focus groups can be very expensive, and they're only usually as good as their moderator, which is a tad iffy. So yeah, so this is who we thought we were going to talk to. We should definitely talk to them, but it turns out we need to be talking to this person too. So there's a mother now, who, who's she buying the furniture for? Is it a little kid's room? Is it um, their, their high school age kids and stuff like that? What are the barriers? What are the opportunities? So I think that um, when people talk about creative, it's like, oh, you know, they're crazy creative guys, you know, the wacky nut bars. Oh, but there's also a rational side to it. And I think if you take creatives and you feed their heads and you get them the sort of information and demand that they come up with something novel, that's when creative happens. The rest of it's just design and wallpaper. I mean, let's face it. If you say, I mean, and not, not to belittle the designer's craft, but a designer stands there, he or she, and says, what would you like me to make today? Right? That's their job. I mean, they're, they're really wonderful at, at embellishing, you know, sort of thing. When I was in general advertising, the role of an art director was to come up with a concept, the idea that then drove the art. The photographer wouldn't then go out and take the picture and record the sound and paint, you know, all that sort of business. But we weren't typesetters. We weren't a lot of things. We had to be sort of quote, like pan-globalist, and we had to bring a lot of things together. And weirdly, despite the fact that this digital medium allows for that in abundance, we don't seem to do it as much. It's like the large agencies that I've worked for, and it's, which is why I finally you know, lit my hair on fire and went running from the room, is that um, everything's siloed. And it's like, well, the client didn't pay for any of this. It's like, it's not a question of if. You have to do this. I mean, if I was the creative director of a company that just won Victoria's Secret, I have a real problem. I don't wear women's underwear, okay? I don't get it. I never bought women's underwear. I don't know who buys women's underwear. I don't know the, the nuances of it. But I really owe it to my users, right, and the company that I'm working for to genuinely figure that out. So I would also, this is another thing that I found that didn't happen in digital agencies. Um, we did uh, Philly.com, and everyone was from Philly, and they all had their, their mythos of Philly together. So we went as a group, and we walked. We started at Pax and Gino. We went to the Italian section. We went into Old City and stuff. I had everyone take notes. And what came out of that, um, the, the sort of odd creative essence that then drove the rest of our work was, was Philadelphia was about beautiful grit. You know, there was something, there was a certain worn quality to it. And that was a real insight for the group, because they were like, oh, Philly's like cheesesteaks and wacky, you know, sports fans. And it's like, no, that's arrogant. No city can be reduced, or no, no brand, or no customer can be reduced to anything that rudely elemental. So I would send, go to the store. If you're advertising the candy bar, eat one of the damn things. If it's a, a car company, let's all go and drive their car. They did that when I worked on Oldsmobile. They took us to a test track. We had to wear fireproof suits. It was, it was all unbelievably cool. The entire creative team really got into that project. So this is what this is. This is that. I mean, it is it is a big obsidian block because there's so much of it. But I think if you begin to pick and choose your battles as to where you're going to sort of accrue this data and your own sort of internal process of distilling it, it becomes transparent. Because and this is my final slide. Data is numbers. That doesn't matter. It's when they get analyzed. What you're looking for is patterns that people leave. It's like jet contrails in the sky, right? You're looking for, for patterns that people leave in their digital exercises as they try to really accomplish things 
and get on with their life. And I think you can get a lot of um, insight and inspiration from data. So I know a lot of people think that data is like, you know, designing the Manhattan Yellow Pages or something like that. There's insight to be had in there, and I think creatives need to be sort of brought to the well and baptized. So that is all. The comment he made in there made me nervous about moderating when he brought up the market research and that it's only as good as the moderator because to bring up uh, part of Ed's, this could be sucky if this was judged based on the moderator. So um, with all that said, I really appreciate Brian's presentation and Ed's. Uh, and once again, it was Brian Crooks from Influence Interactive and Ed McLaughlin from SVM eMarketing. And what we'd like to do now is take the rest of the session and open it up to questions from the floor. So if I could have the gentleman uh, come up to the table. And any questions you may have about cloud computing, open source, some of the topics that we've touched upon, uh, feel free. Um, Ms. Brody. Um, I didn't really get a sense of what your companies do, if you could go through a brief description of what you do. Sure. Uh, my company, uh, SBME Marketing Solutions, we're a B2B online marketing agency. Uh, we've been in business since 1995. Our, uh, our core focus is manufacturing and uh, industrial distribution, so we, we call it uh, you know, industrial online marketing. Uh, although we've worked with companies uh, across, uh, across uh, just about every industry, for-profit, not-for-profit, in our, our many years. So, uh, and uh, uh, I'm a co-owner and founder of the company. And um, uh, my title uh, I've chosen is marketing technologist, and I, I think that says uh, a lot about how we approach uh, what we do. Um, you know, we are, uh, in my mind, we are uh, uh, an embodiment of that idea of the distributed agency. So, uh, you know, I uh, I didn't come up with the idea and then go about seeing if we could implement it. What happened is that we kind of grew into this thing that I took a step back and I thought we're, we're doing something I think fairly novel here about how we operate. I suspect that maybe Brian's company operates in a similar way. I, I, no, it actually does. It's, um, our motto is big agency results um, without the baggage. Um, there's a, a lot of, couple of uh, ex-Razorfish, expats, and someone from IMC Squared, we decided to come together. Um, we, when I was at Razorfish, we had started putting together a truly unified team with IAUX and creative brought together into what we then called experience design. The, the other so things that we... Can you just backtrack and give them a, what an IAUX oh, is? Oh, information architect or user experience. So that's, in the old school way, they would come up, they actually started with library sciences and they would sort of come up with these um, logical paradigms or these, these sort of superstructures that would, that would sort of house all the data. Then it would go to the quote unquote creative department that would stretch a sock puppet over it. Um, so what we're doing is we're bringing those people together because that's, that's infinitely creative, right? The structure of the thing, plus all the conventional creatives, plus all the analytics and, and data people, you know, and stuff like that. Everyone has been anointed to be creative, but everyone has also been anointed to be these other things. So Influence Interactive, we are a digital agency, but we're trying to do something different, um, like one like hive mind kind of thing, we hope. Uh, well, my question is for Ed. Uh, towards the end of your presentation, you said something to the effect of, if you're not doing SEO, why aren't you? And my question is, why would anyone waste their time doing something that has no longer any effect? There is only really one, maybe two or three at the most search engines anyone would ever care about. Google, uh, Twitter, and maybe Facebook. And instead of doing SEO, you really should be doing social marketing. Why would anyone waste their time? Do Oh, not, not only that, but Google, they change their algorithm every so often because they don't want people to game their system. The other search engines do also, but who cares about Yahoo? Nobody goes there anymore. So why did, I, I don't understand what your point was. Well, I don't, I don't, see, the, I don't see the rise of, of, uh, of, um, of one set of media or capabilities uh, meaning the demise of the other. So I don't think it's an either, either or. The fact is, um, if, you, uh, if you take a look at the analytics, all of my clients 
50, 60 percent of their traffic at any given moment comes from Google. So if I was selling a product, I'd want it in Walmart, you know, even if Walmart wasn't the most interesting store happening uh, in, in the marketplace. So Google is the Walmart of search. Um, Yahoo uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Bing, you know, they're, they're not that critical for, for, for our audience, for B2B. But Google is still, uh, is still hugely important. It still drives a tremendous amount of traffic to the site. It doesn't mean that, uh, it doesn't mean, again, it's not an either or. I, I think you need to be focused on SEO. I think you need to be focused on, on social. I think you need to be focused on how the two of them interact with each other, because they do. Well, I, I agree that, that Google is important, but you don't really have, in the organic listings, you don't really have much control. In the, in the paid listings, you have more control. I think, I think you're, 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 um, you're uh, uh, not, not correct. Uh, I think there's an amazing amount of control that you can have. Not, not that it's not difficult, but it certainly doesn't have the immediate uh, impact that you can have with a pay-per-click campaign if you're willing to spend. Even pay-per-click, though, to some extent, SEO is important, you know, uh, making sure that you are, you know, what it ultimately is is this. SEO, pay-per-click, social media, they all come down to the same thing. How are people looking for what you sell? What language are they using? And, uh, and uh, where are they looking for it? If they're looking for it in a search engine, and they're using certain keyword phrases, the language that you speak on your website needs to be the language that your customer speaks. So if you're selling, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, I don't know, if you're selling Band-Aids and somebody else is selling, you know, adhesive uh, health strips, you know, um, people are looking for Band-Aids, you know. So yes, it's a brand name, so, you know, someone's got the, uh, the market cornered on that. But it ultimately comes down to people are talking about the things that you sell. You need, you need to use uh, uh, your language. They're searching for the things that you sell. You need to use uh, their language so that when people do search, you will pop up. Search engine optimization, it, it works. It works. You don't have to do, do you know, uh, uh, crazy things. You don't have to use, you know, uh, uh, stealth techniques to do it. But it's an iterative process, and uh, uh, it's definitely part of the online marketing mix. It's part of the mix, part of, part of what has to happen. I have to agree. We... Um we're dealing currently with a, an, an insurance company that is so far down in the Google rankings. And remember that this is a, this is a rational decision. Um, that, uh, you know, they, they've really sort of dithered away a great opportunity and it's gonna take a lot of work to get them even mildly back up. So, I mean, I believe that, that search engines, at least in the near term, um, are, are potent enough that you can't um, close your eyes and wish them away. Well, then how do you deal with it when Google changes its ranking algorithm every so often. I, well, I, again, I don't speak as an expert of SEO, but I work with a guy that is. And uh, the, the changes are usually about like, like sort of fraudulent things. This insurance company, if it had been more judicious in its use of language, right, from the beginning of its digital presence, would right now be relatively high up in the rankings. Um, and that might fluctuate because the algorithm changes mildly. But again, Google is not doing wholesale reinventions. They are sort of stopping bad practices, you know, honestly. But I think if you, if you do, like, honest search engine optimization to a site, you can bring people up in the search rankings. Mm -hmm. And to both of their points, um, when you look at the most recent uh, Google algorithm change, um, it is based on a lot of fraudulent activity. But the, when you take it up a level outside of search engine optimization and look at search engine friendliness inside of pages, it's about the importance of the relevance of your content. It's about the, the quality of your page construction because that's what's now being indexed as opposed to before you could stuff your pages with a bunch of keywords and get them listed high. But now you have to have a well-constructed page in order to get it any sort of decent rankings. And that's just good practices. So you're not necessarily creating pages just to appease Google but you're using their sort of best practice model to create a, a well-constructed sound site. Um, also, if you're running any sort of AdWords campaign, your, the quality of your site can directly affect your cost per click price. If you've got a non-search engine friendly landing page, that could double, triple, quadruple your cost per click. So, and you had brought up the topic before that they're not revolutionary changes in the algorithms. They're usually just slight tweaks within it. 
And if you partner with somebody or if you stay ahead of um, their Google, usually post it to their blog, they let you know well in advance what types of changes are coming, what you can look out for, and, um, and you can stay ahead of it. But I think in no way should search engine optimization be discredited or even be pushed aside compared to social media because social media in some people's mind can be considered also kind of a fad. You know, so it would be a shame to stop putting effort into one area to focus on one just to have that search engine come back into, you know, that being the primary search technique in two or three years when Facebook blows up, when their privacy finally ticks everybody off and they're like, oh, we're not doing this anymore. When everybody's tired of reading about Tim Tebow, you know, on Twitter. So, you know, you don't ever want to exclude yourself from a certain technology in favor of one other because it might not make sense at the time. You know, it's just, it's about good practices. Right. I'll, and the same thing goes with social media, right? You, you open yourself to a certain liability if you dabble in social media. A lot of companies have been burned. I mean, imagine if someone sort of, um, you know, in, in a very sort of ham-fisted way, you know, insinuates themselves into the social media. Those same people might go on Google, and when they, the results that they show up are the pillorying of the company that just decided to do that. So, I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that um, the best advice for most companies is be honest. I mean, build really good user experiences because you appreciate your customers and you believe in what it is you're doing, you know, and I think that that is a pretty good way of staying, you know, not running afoul of the big business bad stuff. Do no evil. Mm -hmm. Let me have the position for you. I had a comment and then a question. Um, <clears throat> comment was in regards to the SEO thing. I think just for, from a point of clarity, maybe what we're talking about is the difference between uh, the view of SEO and the practice of SEO where it's kind of snake oil sales and it's shady techniques and really dodgy black hat stuff versus well-constructed content that's on target, relevant, and, and totally transparent to the search engines so that it picks it up like that. Two totally different ways of approaching it. One is lots of weird tricks. The other one is just straight down the middle, make good content. Right, well, the other one is knowing who the, the, the audience is, knowing who the customer is, yeah. knowing how they speak, using it for, for uh, uh, SEO, of course, you know, for your content, but really using it everywhere. You know, using that, what you learn from that analysis, keyword analysis, to, uh, to inform all of your and, the, and my question was for Brian, I'm wondering what thoughts do you have on uh, how some of those techniques, you were talking about the data-driven stuff, would scale to uh, smaller projects, smaller agencies, right. or individuals. The, uh, for, getting, like, for example, the Quantcast stuff that I showed is available. You can go to quantcast.com and type in any URL. Um, you can get extra performance out of it by subscribing and stuff, Radian 6. Most of these things are pretty inexpensive, um, or in fact free, or some version of them is free. It's like Google Analytics. Um, it's not hard to implement for your clients and get some really meaningful things. I mean. Yeah, it'd be great if they have Omniture or some higher level sort of stuff. I think that that's the beauty of it. it. There once was a time when agencies had account planners and entire research staffs that had to comb through kind of more analog stuff to get at the insights sort of thing. Um, that's the beauty of these. Um, it kind of works hand in glove with what I was talking about. They are online, um, easily accessible and We've done some of these things where we've run it um, on a site for a week. As, as long as you get a statistically, yeah, let me try that again, statistically significant sample um, that you can draw conclusions from. So I, I think they really are very scalable. You know? And again, the boots on the street sort of thing um, is sometimes even harder because you've got you know, people, billable hours, you know, sitting in front of stores talking to people, doing man on the street interviews conducting usability tests, going to a thing where you're doing eye tracking, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think some of these, these more vapor trail capture things um, can be a great way to sort of offset a lot of, you know, man on the street stuff. You brought up a great point of clarity, and I'm glad you did at the beginning about the white hat and the black hat SEO, because that is, I think, a great source of frustration uh, with people, and I think that can tie in almost with your statement before about almost giving up on SEO, because it, the perception is 
you're going up against either guys with huge budgets or guys that are doing things that are legal. You know, we can have a whole seminar on setting up a server farm on how to generate, you know, 300,000 pingbacks to, you know, drive up your results. But I can tell you that the good sites will always prevail because it is the constant changing of the algorithms and it's the constant um, monitoring of these companies just to make sure that, you know, they are excluding and making sure that people aren't taking advantage of the system. There are flaws in it, and they try and work through them. Yeah, I think the other great thing is, um, and a, that's the other thing about doing this kind of analysis, we all sort of, we're all driven by the collective genius of all those eight grillion users out there and the things that they do. They, they own the means of production, you know. Like, to stay up to pace with people now, you have to recognize that they're in charge. So if you do something in a shady fashion or haphazardly or whatever with uh, one of the brands or the companies that you represent, and the users catch wind of it, they'll kill you. Um, you know, you, you will be responsible for absolutely destroying it. So, I mean, th that's the best watchdog there is, I think. And I think that there's the, the kind of SEO nonsense, the, the black hats, if you will, um, a lot of them have been jumped out of business, and it's sort of like the disreputable clients are going to those disreputable purveyors. You know what I mean? It's like if I wanted to sell snake oil, I'd go find a charlatan. You know, it's that kind of thing. So. This is a question for any of you. L looking at all of the technologies that are out there and social sites and even the proliferation of agencies, how do marketing professionals and corporate executives really identify which ones are relevant for them and how to decide who to work with? So how do they, how do I identify? It's two questions. It's two questions. Identifying what, what resources and what sites and what technologies we should use for our companies and then also find, finding the right agency to work with. Yeah, so, so one thing I would say is that there isn't, there isn't a, a right agency to work with. I think that, um, you know, part of, part of the success that we've had with our model, with the distributed agency, is that we, we have, uh, we have, um, you know, uh, groups at bat, and then we have uh, uh, people uh, that are on the bench, and um, and um, we try to have you know a roster of, of, of people. We work with smaller groups because uh, we find that uh, the larger they get, the um, you know what can happen is uh, start, when you start to work with outside companies is that uh, you have a honeymoon period where. You know, you're, you're obviously, you're getting great account managers, you're getting great project managers, you're getting great whatever it happens to be, developers, designers, whatever, and, uh, uh, and then they lose interest, or they get somebody uh, hot and new and interesting, and, and suddenly you feel like the A players have all moved on. So, so we try to work with smaller groups, because we find, uh, uh, like us, we're a small company, we're very responsive. You know, if any of my clients wants to talk with, you know, the, 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 the partners, um, my extension is, is, uh, is freely available to all of them. So they can call me, and if there's a problem, we resolve the problem. So we look for the same uh, uh, kinds of traits in the companies that we work with, and, uh, and we try to have a roster of them. We try to have uh, you know, different people that we're providing different projects to or uh, making different requests from, so that, one, you know, we're, we're distributing the problem across multiple, uh, uh, across multiple um, uh, players, and uh, we're not exposed. We're not reliant on a, 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 a single partner for some critical service. So, and uh, we evaluate them one at a time, one at a time, one project at a time. We try to start small. We evaluate how it goes, and if it works well, we provide more. And it's kind of constantly monitoring the uh, the quality uh, uh, and uh, um, um, the quality of the output that we're, we're getting. But you're not searching these people out. You're using networking techniques, word of mouth. I would say that the ones that I've had the most uh, success with, the companies that I've had the most success with are um, the groups that I've had the most success with where we're, we're giving them large projects are, uh, are people that I have found through word of mouth or through networking or um, getting out there into the world, you know, and, um, and uh, you know, attending conferences and going, going where they are. So, so uh, so I can shake a hand and, and get a sense of what they're doing and how they approach business. So those are the, those are the, the companies that are our most trusted partners, are people that we found through networking. 
But we, we have a lot of uh, production requirements like, like any, any other uh, company. And, um, um, you know, Craigslist has been, uh, has been a, 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 a great thing to find people that come in and, and that, that are interested in doing piece work or, uh, 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 and from there, finding, finding people that are very good at things and, and uh, turning them into somebody that we're doing work with on a regular basis. So, um, so uh, it's possible to find people anywhere and everywhere. The, um, the, uh, the Odesks, the Guru.com, uh, Elancers, those are good places to find qualified people, but, um, you know, there's, uh, there's fees associated with it. If you're playing by the book, if you sign up to use Odesk and you find a, uh, a, a partner, you know, a, a, a person or a company to work with, you, know, you, you are paying a percentage uh, to Odesk. Uh, a lot of companies will try to game it by, you know, basically uh, uh, saying like, well, we're going to charge you this much per hour plus a 10%, you know, Odesk fee, basically. So um, the, uh, the providers are supposed to pay Odesk. So what they do is they, they say, here's my price, and I'll need 10%, and that 10% goes to Odesk. So you end up paying Odesk anyway directly. So, um, and the other ones, guru.com, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, so um, trial and error. What it comes down to. Can we touch real quick? Um, I don't think we answered the social media portion of it, the finding the proper platform. Does somebody want to touch on Yeah, I, I guess what I would say is um, it's a little bit like Photoshop. There's, there's 10,000 ways to do the same thing. Um, you get comfortable with certain ways to do it. Um, what we've done is, um, we've, is First, you need to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish. It's like, how much do I need to know? How much contact do I have? I mean, we've, I've had plenty of clients that say, I want a Facebook page. And it's like, but who's going to feed it? I mean, y you know, this is, you, you're kind of making a kind of a contract with your users out there, you know, sort of thing. So when it comes to specifically social, um, it's like, what kind of contact do we need? Um, at what kind of frequency? Um, and can we legitimately populate it? Do we have anything that's relevant to say? You know, I mean, uh, I'm with you. Social media um, is great in some respects and completely irrelevant in others. Um, again, it's the flavor of the month. Um, it, it's, a, it's a good one and it's enormously powerful, but I don't know that if I was a, oh, a manufacturer of caskets um, that I should be tweeting too damn much. You know what I mean? Um, it's just like, so. Actually, and to your point, I will uh, food shop in a just nondescript block of cheese store wrapped with just a find it on Facebook uh, sticker on it. What am I finding on Facebook? Right. Do I want to learn about your just... Well, there's the new scratch and cheese. sniff feature of Facebook. I don't know if you, uh, you've heard yeah. about that. By, by the same token, the, uh, the Clorox fan page, Clorox, bleach. It's got like 30,000, you know, fans on its, on its fan page on Facebook, you know? Go figure, you know, so. Uh, People are passionate about their bleach. Nothing I like more than walking in the house and that crisp smell of bleach hits me, you know. It's and I try to think, oh, maybe Clorox is more than bleach. I just don't understand it. But no, Clorox is really bleach. I mean, that's really, that's what Clorox is. Yeah. <coughs> All right, so I think to kind of summarize what you're saying is that you can't go into it with a predetermined set of sites. Okay, we're going to do a Facebook page. It's more about understanding the client's needs asking them the questions, and then those questions are going to sort of determine what platform. Wow. And what well, I think one of the things, um, the, the, best, the best clients that I've had are the ones that agree with me when I say, you know, hi, um, we are, I will partner with you, but I work for your users. Um, really, at the end of the day, if I'm going to build an experience that's, that's, that's beneficial to your brand, that's meaningful to these people, that's relevant, that's elegant, and call it what you will, but it, it, I, I, I have to see it through their eyes. I mean, I just, there's just no other way about it. And so that goes to the entire digital ecosystem. You know, it's like, do you really need to be here? You know, will this, will a Facebook page for you add value? Now, maybe I've come up with a very sort of clever way that I think I can bring relevance to your brand within that specific space. Then that's worth talking about and exploring sort of thing. So I don't know if I answered anything. I just said a lot of stuff. But uh, I think you got it. Good. Did you actually ask a question that had anything to do with what I said? <laughs> um, Ed, in your presentation, you had mentioned collaborative and project services, which yeah. I think you identified as services that people could use to collaborate on a project and get yeah, stuff done. Yeah, 
do that. either of you actually use those services in your own agencies? And if so, which services and for what? Sure. Well, uh, yeah, we use um, we use uh, Basecamp, and um, uh, and uh, we use it because it works. Uh, it's very simple, and I would say that we use it not because it works, you know, remarkably well for us. I think there are some things that it could do better for us. It works really well for us as an interface to our clients, and and we've been using it for for a number of years now with with many many uh, projects for many many clients. I have never, I have yet to have an instance where a client says, "I don't get how this base camp thing works." You know, um, so that's the measure of, of success: is that it just, it just works well for our clients, keeps everything together in one place. So, base camp for us is great. For the, uh, for for uh, the partners that we work with, for people that are providing the services, we use a lot of different tools, and because we're doing. Ourselves, we do you know, uh, a fair amount of, um, uh, of web development and, and interactive uh, design. We use uh, we use tools like Redmine, which uh, are very helpful for you know developers uh, uh, use it to track problems, requests, case, cases for for building stuff. So um, so Basecamp, uh, Redmine, um, we use uh, a, a hosted. Uh, uh, time and uh, uh, timekeeping system is called Workflow Max, and um, again, it's simplicity. Um, and the simplicity is because we have the partner companies that we're working with logging right into that system and putting their time in. So we're able to say, you know, I need uh, Joe Smith out there in Utah to work on this project. We assign a set of tasks to Joe Smith. Joe Smith does them, and when he's done, he puts it right into our system. So we're able to capture. That. And that's that's one of the illustrations of that way to sort of not just find people to work with, but to work with them seamlessly, to work with them almost as, effect, as effectively as if they were in uh, you know uh, an office down the hallway. So um, so those are those are some of the tools that we use: Workflow Max, Basecamp, Redmine. So no, I've uh, the other ones not so much, but um, I've never worked on a timekeeping system in any company that I've ever been with that I ever liked. So maybe I'll have a look at that one. But I have used Basecamp before. It's great. It's just a, it's a, it's, I think it become by and large an industry standard. Hi, um, I wanted to ask you, it seems like you're acting, um, there's a uh, plan, there's an obsolescence to what, you're, you're acting as a facilitator, or as a, uh, um, an identifier of the best products and services out there. What prevents you from losing your customers to the, the very services that you're, you're identifying to your customers that you're using to produce the results that you are. So what prevents my customers from just going out and starting to use them themselves? I, exactly. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, what, what prevents your customers from going out and trying to do their own advertising, their own printing, their own, uh, their own uh, public relations, you know? In some cases, nothing. They, 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 they go and do it, and in some cases, they do it very well. Uh, in some cases, they do, do not do it very well. So ultimately, what maintains the, the customer relationships and, and what keep, what brings them to us to leverage those tools is is experience and expertise and and, uh, and the ability to uh, not to use the tools because it's not about how well do I use Basecamp or how effective am I at um, at uh, you know uh, 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 Photoshop or Flash. It's really it's about the ideas. How well do we understand how to translate what you are selling and what your prospects and customers need into um, into actionable content and, and, and measurable uh, results? And measurable results. Yeah. Well, the other thing I would say is that um, more than just being a liaison with some of these services, like we work with a tech development company that does some very very deep stuff, um, uh, like. Uh, native iPhone, iPad development stuff, um, SQL Server databases, and all this kind of stuff, which would be ludicrous for us to sort of take on, you know, that, that depth of technical expertise. But more than just being a sort of a, a pass-off or a part of the daisy chain between them and our clients, it's we're kind of concocting the ideas and doing the research that shows our clients what it is we believe they need, what the benefits are, what the metrics we're going to use to sort of make sure that, that what we promise we're delivering 
we can deliver or optimize going forward and those kind of things. And I think it's that, that partnership. Um, one, of the, look, one of the ways we like to look at our company is we call it the film model. So agencies have a lot of like grips and gaffers and best boys and you know there's, there's a ton of people. There's a huge lot of overhead and to your point, you know, the A team pitches you, but the B or the C team is the one that services your account. And I think um, that's where the other thing about um, scale goes. We're going to be very cognizant of the scale that we get to. Um, because I'd like to go in with every account and say, you're working with the writer, the producer, the director, the cinematographer, and the editor. Okay, right? We're, like, we're going to control the story so that if you need a lavish Broadway musical or you need an underwater documentary, we're going to assemble the team that can put that together for you, but we're going to be there like understanding the needs and, and, and helping you do that sort of thing. So I think there's that, that crucial bond. And I think there always does have to be a, a, a core batch of people. I just don't think it has to be a skyscraper on Madison Avenue with 800 people in it. And I, I think to that point, yeah, the, the, I think to operate well under that model, you, 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 if you're going to, if you're selling um, retainer-based services, if you're selling larger scale um, um, uh, projects, uh, you need to have a core set of people that are, um, that, are, that are seasoned or that you are seasoning, right? So you need to have capable account managers, capable project managers who understand strategy and they understand what their role is to uh, conceive of uh, and, uh, and understand a strategy with a client and be able to, as Brian was saying, put together the team that can deliver on that strategy. Right. And, and keep them on time, on budget, exactly, on strategy, exactly, exactly. on brand and stuff. The, the one example I would point out is uh, Comcast. Um, they have a lot of creative services that they've taken in-house, um, but much to their in-house creative dismay, the Comcast, all the big TV ads, I think, are handled by Deutsch out of New York. You know what I mean? So that's one of those weird hybrids, but I've seen it happen again and again where a lot of companies said, we don't need, I don't need no stinking ad agency, or I don't need no stinking digital thing, we'll just take it in. Times get tough, and some accountant within the firm wakes up one day and says, look, we make bottled water. What the Christ are we doing with the creative department? You know, that's not core to our business. We can, we can rent that out. So it's a, it's a slippery slope. I think that the, the companies that say, I could do that better than any agency, it's like, live and be well, you know. And to summarize that, with a, I heard a great analogy a while back when somebody had asked a, a similar question. What these gentlemen were talking about are the tools, you know, just like a contractor has. Nothing would stop somebody from going into Lowe's and purchasing the equipment and the material to build your own house. But when you do it the first time and it collapses on you, you learn it the hard way. You know, and we've dealt with clients, we'll put a site together, they realize that they can get it for free on WordPress and have it self-hosted. Well, when you look at the limitations, the lack of service, the lack of a dedicated account, there's so many things that you're missing, it's hard to tell. It's just like dealing with your kids. You'll learn your lesson one day. You know, sure, you'll, you'll walk away this time, but you'll be back eventually. You'll put an eye out. Yes, exactly, exactly. Chainsaws are dangerous. Yes. You know? That's right. I think we have time for one more question, and then we're going to wrap this up. Excellent. Just thank you for your presentations. They're really great. Um, you know, one of the things that's hard to get a, a handle on is all these tools that are out there. And I wonder if you all could just talk about how do you manage your tools? How do you make decisions on the tools that you use? How often are you switching tools? Um, do you go through your tool catalogs and say, oh, I really like that one. I'm going to try this one instead. How do you, how do you just manage that? Because that seems like that seems hard to do in it, itself. Yeah, it, again, like I was kind of addressing that before. There, there's a lot of redundancy in the marketplace. So, um, you know, what Forrester does um, can be sort of purchased elsewhere, and you kind of have to hold both of them up and say, you know, I, I, like the, I like the cut of this one better. You know, this one just seems to be better. And, and, and again, there's always there's, there's a trillion people who would love to come in and demonstrate their wares. You can get to a saturation point. The, the, again, the problem is there's a book out right now, Drinking from a Fire Hose. There's so much data out there and there's so many tools to do it. Uh, you, you have to be practical. I mean, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, not, you're, not, uh, I'm, you know, you're not Caltech mathematicians, you know, sort of thing. So there has to be a limit. I think you pick a core set. 
um, when you understand the kind of things that you want to know, um, that would really, like, it, like, it's really great if I know who I'm talking to and what their sentiments are. And then like any other thing, it's like, you know, um, I may work on this job and use these five tools, but not this one. And the next job, I may use those five tools and bring in this one. So you, you mix and match. And then you just, uh, you, you stay abreast of things, you know, you know, of things. You can go to, um, there are conferences. You can certainly go to South by Southwest every year and things like that. There's a lot of ways to do it. But it's, it's you know, it's about um, intelligently sort of filtering, you know, which includes the amount of tools you use. I think you can go a little bit overboard. Yeah, I mean, this is an indication probably of the, the challenges that, uh, that that these companies face with their um, their their marketing, their business models. But um, uh, I don't ever want to get married to another piece of software ever again. You know? So I want to be able to um, pay as I go, use it on demand. If I only need one person in the organization using it, and I can get a single user license, uh, I'll get a single user license. And if I can use it for the one month that I need, uh, I'll pay for it for that one person for one month. Uh, and then uh, maybe, you know, six months later, two people use it. So I want, I want, uh, I want the, uh, all the benefits of, uh, of um, software on demand and software as a service. And um, that's, one of, that's one of the measures. I mean, just the economics of it. And uh, if something comes up and, and it turns out to be better, I will unfortunately abandon, you know, my my relationship with the company pretty quickly. So, um, uh, yeah. So that that's uh, that's one of the measures is that um, I won't tie myself to anything that's uh, that's very expensive. But uh, the the next uh, measure, more important than that, is that it needs to it needs to perform. It needs to deliver um, whatever it is that it, that it's intending to deliver. And um, and its ability to do that is is uh, it's you know it's twofold. One is is, uh, is the set of capabilities that it provides, and uh, um, two is the the requirements. Um, you know, we were saying like Omniture is a massive application. Uh, uh, the vast majority of well, I would say all but one of my clients, uh, Google Analytics, is a fabulous tool, and, and it's free. Well, and, and look at content management systems. I don't know many people that are doing, you know, big interwoven things when there are like uh, like open source ones and, and things like that, that. That more often than not are absolutely perfect for the users. And the one cautionary tale about you know, like software companies who insisted people get wed to them and be arrogant. I mean, who uses Quark Express anymore? Should I get rid of that? Oh, <laughs> hell yes. <laughs> no. Back to page maker. Yes. And those funky monitors that you could do. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, and with that, uh, we'll conclude our new tools and environments for creatives. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed it. And we're going to be getting a document posted by next week of some links and resources from everybody. So check back, and um, we'll have that on the camera site. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this program from the New Jersey Communications Advertising and Marketing Association. For more information, visit our website, njcama.org, or follow us on Twitter, at njcama. We produce this program in the studios of Lubetkin Global Communications in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. This program is copyright 2012. Betkin Global Communications, all rights reserved. If you're interested in sponsoring these programs, please write steve at lubetkincommunications.com. For all of us at the New Jersey Communications Advertising and Marketing Association, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you out there on the net. Take good care.